Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to Jurassic World Evolution, where I've been tinkering around in sandbox mode, building a massive nature reserve for all kinds of different species of dinosaur, and just seeing how they get along with each other, trying to figure out what it is that makes dinosaur behaviour tick. The theory being that as long as all of their basic needs are provided for, they should be able to coexist peacefully, even dinosaurs that don't get along with specific other species of dinosaur. It was a little bit more complicated than you might expect, even when I was just dealing with the herbivores, because not even all herbivores will coexist peacefully. You see, each dinosaur species has a certain very specific set of needs that must be catered for. Generally speaking, all of them require access to water, that's fairly obvious. They also all require access to a certain type of food, and the food types are different for every species. Sauropods, like the Brachiosaur, require access to tall leaves with fruit and nuts, the kind of food that they can happily munch on because of their long necks in the taller branches of trees, and this has to be provided for them. Grazing herbivores, like the Stegosaur or the Triceratops, require access to ground fibre, the kind of food that they can happily graze on at ground level. And then, of course, there's the size of the population groups, because a lot of these herbivores are effectively herd animals, and they get lonely if they don't have enough of the same species in close proximity. So you have to carefully manage the numbers of dinosaurs of each species. You also have to ensure that they all have enough space to happily run around in, and that space has to be filled with the kind of environment that they prefer. Some dinosaurs are happier with a lot of forest, some prefer open space, some of them are perfectly happy living in grasslands. Some prefer sand and rock in order to feel at home. And then, when it comes to each individual species, there are certain other species that they are perfectly content to coexist with, and other species that they are not. And even amongst the herbivores, this can get quite tricky. Brachiosaurs, for example, do not like the presence of other sauropods. You drop in a Camarasaur or a Diplodocus or two, and they get a bit antsy. They don't appear to like the competition. Most of the herbivores are quite content with other herbivores, but species like the Triceratops, who really just don't seem to particularly like any other species of dinosaur. Apparently, Triceratops are very judgmental, which can be a bit of a problem because they're a very, very popular species of dinosaur with a huge amount of guest appeal, so you're probably going to want to have them in your park, and yet you're going to have to find a way of having them peacefully coexist with the other dinosaurs, or just put them in their own enclosure. Having said that though, the herbivores, even a fussy species like the Triceratops, are capable of coexisting peacefully, even if they're enclosed with other species of herbivores that they don't particularly like very much. But what happens if you introduce a species of dinosaur into the same enclosure that is actively disliked by everybody else? How about a huge predator, like a Tyrannosaurus rex? You'd think that the answer would be obvious. Utter bloody carnage and mayhem. And yet, it turns out, at least in Jurassic World Evolution 2, that even something as notoriously violent as a Tyrannosaurus Rex is entirely capable of coexisting with herbivores, prey animals, as long as its needs are catered for. Obviously, a carnivore's needs are a little bit more tricky than something like a herbivore, because carnivore food doesn't actually grow on trees. Little scavengers and mammal hunters, like the concept makers here, are relatively easy to take care of because they're not really a threat to any of the other dinosaurs. And as long as they give them a supply of meat, they're perfectly happy, and the other herbivores actually seem to quite like them. A tyrannosaur, a hunting predator, does also require prey. You can dump as much meat on the ground as you want, and the tyrannosaur will eat it, but it won't be happy. It's got that itch that it needs to scratch, it has to hunt. That, of course, is where the live prey feeder comes in. And it turns out that as long as there are a couple of live prey feeders in the park, regardless of how far away they are, as far as Trixie the Tyrannosaur here is concerned, that need has been provided for, and she does not go hunting the other herbivores. This much, of course, we did discover in the previous video. 
But this is basically just a summary. All right, Akizuki, I'll get to the point. The point is, since the last video, there have been some developments. That, kids, is a dead Brachiosaur. There's actually more than one. There are two dead Brachiosaurs, and neither of them died of natural causes. Putting my Inspector Poirot hat on, I discovered that they'd both been fatally wounded by Trixie the Tyrannosaur, while I wasn't looking. So, Trixie, have you been a bad girl? There are two dead Brachiosaurs in the park. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? More importantly, what went wrong? What was it that changed? Well, as you can see, I've been introducing further new species into the park. These are Parasaurophilus, they're a type of Hadrosaur. But it's not like Trixie has a particular hard-on for Hadrosaurs, and anyway, she didn't go after them. She went after the Brachiosaurs. So what gives? Was it perhaps the presence of the other new species I'd introduced, the Iguanodon? I dunno, doubt it. She didn't go after the Iguanodon either. It was the poor old Brachiosaurs who suffered her wrath. And they never did anything to her. There she is, looking all innocent. Yeah, you know what you did. So, I was stumped. I couldn't figure out what had changed, so I decided to keep an eye on her. Just to see exactly what was going to trigger her next kill, because if she'd already off to two Brachiosaurs for no apparently good reason... Aside from the fact that she's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> Which for most people would be reason enough. Yeah, I know. But I wanted to figure out exactly what it was that was going to trigger her next murderous rampage when everything had been going so well in the last episode. And see exactly what it is that's causing this experiment to fail. So I kept a very careful eye on Trixie the T-Rex here. And just waited her for to do something bad. And I waited. And I waited some more. And then I waited even more. And she just didn't do anything suspicious. Even when lunch was wandering right in front of her. She just was on her best behaviour. So eventually I got bored of waiting. And I went back to introduce some more new species to the park. A couple of Camerasaurs to top off the sauropod population, and more Hadrosaurs, the Allura Titan here. And while my back was turned, <laughs> almost the second I stepped away to breed two new species, you'll never guess what happened. Ha! Caught her in the act! <laughs> What's different? The only thing I've done is introduce new species into the park. Oh, hang on a minute. Maybe that's it. You see, it turns out that as well as having to provide the basics like food, water, the correct environment, forest, rocks, sand, grassland, all that kind of thing, and where carnivores are concerned, ensuring that there are prey animals there, provided by the uh, live prey feeders, for them to satisfy that I have to hunt something itch, and also ensuring that each particular species has a large enough group of the same species in order for them to not get lonely. There's one other factor which I had neglected, and which I had made significantly worse by introducing a whole bunch of new species such as the Camerasaur, the Iguanodon, the Allura Titan, the Parasaurophilus, or however the hell you pronounce it. There's an upper limit to the amount of other individual dinosaurs, regardless of species, that certain other dinosaurs will tolerate in the same enclosure. I don't know what the specific number threshold is, and it's different for each species. A Stegosaurus, for example, in a herd of five Stegosaurus will be perfectly happy with any number of other different dinosaurs, as long as, for example, the number of other different dinosaurs doesn't go higher than, say, 25. Like I say, the number is different for each species. But by dumping a whole bunch of other herbivores into the same enclosure, I'd obviously gone higher than the number of other dinosaurs that Trixie was happy to share the park with. Here's the thing, though. 
Jurassic World Evolution deals with this on a per enclosure basis. So what that means is, let's say for example, I had 52 dinosaurs in total in the park and none of those dinosaurs wanted to share their enclosure with more than 25 other dinosaurs. Clearly this wouldn't work because I had 52 in the park, but if I had split those dinosaurs evenly into two separate enclosures, it would be fine. Even if there were 52 dinosaurs in the park, none of those dinosaurs were sharing an enclosure with more than 25 other dinosaurs. And because I haven't split this park up into enclosures, it's essentially one massive enclosure. And there are too many dinosaurs in it. And so Trixie's just doing what comes naturally. She's reducing the number of dinosaurs to a level that she's comfortable with. And for reasons known only to herself, she seems to like starting with the sauropods. It's actually quite interesting to watch because you would think that a tyrannosaur would have a hard time bringing down something as big as that. But watch how she does it. She goes for the legs and the tail. She tries to weaken them until they stumble and fall and then she closes in for the kill. Which, when you think about it, it all makes sense. Triceratops is just lying there like I didn't see nothing. <laughs> Not my problem. This is a sauropod problem. Yep. It's the last surviving Brachiosaur and she's basically bleeding it to death. Going for the legs. It's a remarkably effective technique, considering the size difference between the two of them. Have you ever looked closely at the head of a Tyrannosaurus Rex? 75% of that head is jaw. I mean, the lower jaw makes up half of the head. This animal had the most powerful bite of any creature that ever existed. Oh, there we go. She bled to death. That's what Trixie's doing, and that's why she's doing it. So, with the mystery solved, I thought, what should I do about it? And then I thought, why should I do anything about it? Because Trixie's taking care of the problem all by herself. And then I thought, it's going to be a slow process, though. Perhaps she'd appreciate some assistance. So I bred some Velociraptors. Now, just so you know exactly where we're starting from here, I specifically bred almost all of these raptors to not be hyper-aggressive and to be more sociable, at least as sociable as Velociraptors can ever get. One, however, did have the hyper-aggressive trait, and it's this one. And I did that for a specific reason, because that would make this one the dominant raptor of the pack. And this one, as well as being hyper-aggressive, which is why it's the dominant one, also has the sociability trait. And the way Jurassic World Evolution 2 works is that the dominant animal within any given group, the Alpha, enforces its other traits upon other members of its group or pack. So the theory being that this hyper-aggressive raptor, who's now hiding in the forest, since it is the dominant Alpha of the pack, it will make the others even more sociable. At least, that was the theory. It's almost as if I forgot I was dealing with Velociraptors. Yep, within seconds of dropping them off in the park, these little bastards started trying to murder each other. <laughs> of course they did. They're Velociraptors. This did not bode well for the herbivores. A couple of minutes later, they found the carnivore feeders and they started fighting over the food. <laughs> And then they realised, and I honestly have absolutely no idea why they keep going for the sauropods. <laughs> but at, right after finding the carnivore feeders, they realised that food on the hoof was so much more satisfying. They completely ignored the live prey feeders and just started going straight for the brachiosaurs. What is it about the brachiosaurs? What, what did they ever do to the carnivores? I don't know. Well, they must have done something. I guess they know what they did. And it didn't end with the Velociraptors. Apparently Trixie thought there was a contest on or something, so she started murdering Iguanodons. <laughs> 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 
Seriously, Trixie, it's not a competition. Take your time. And of course, with Trixie providing such a bad example, the Velociraptors, well, they didn't need any encouragement, did they? They're psychopaths. <laughs> You what, the Stegosaurus put up more of a fight than the Brachiosaur. But four against one, it never really stood a chance. I'll tell you what's interesting about Jurassic World Evolution 2 compared to the first game. The way the Velociraptors work together as a pack to take down prey much, much bigger than them. It's fascinating to watch. It's not particularly great from the Stegosaurus perspective, of course, but hey, science. So, good news, I figured out what the problem was. Bad news, the solution involves the mass slaughter of helpless herbivores. <laughs> Maybe the raptors will turn on Trixie. Maybe Trixie doesn't like the competition and will turn on the raptors. Maybe the raptors will stop going on this bloody slaughter once the population levels get down to a manageable amount. Personally, I'm not convinced. Because they're raptors and they're psychopaths. But I guess we'll find out. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.